The following events happened to my mother and I at separate times, and both stories still scare the hell out of me today. But first I need to give you some backstory. I live in a small town in Texas with less than 2,000 people. The first story was when my mom was 18, and the second was when I was 14. The events of the first story happened during my mom's senior year of high school, probably around 86 or 87. It was mid-March, and my mom was celebrating since it was the start of spring break and her best friend Judy's birthday. Her and her friends had the idea to go out to a local lake near our town. I can remember that lake relatively easily. It was roughly an hour and a half from the town I lived in, and my family used to be really big on the outdoors, so we would often go there during our summers to camp and swim. Good times. My mom was never a particularly paranoid person, but she was always one to be wary of her surroundings. She could always tell when something was off, and she would take any means necessary to protect herself. This would mean carrying around her pocket knife wherever she could. I don't think she ever thought she would need it. It was just more of a precaution. But on this particular night, she definitely did. She was out at the lake with her friends, boozing, listening to music, swimming, and making out with their boyfriends, and just having a good time. A couple of hours into their party, my mom had to use the bathroom. Coincidentally, they had set up camp far from where any of the designated porta potties were, so she just went out into the woods. She was stumbling around for a couple of minutes, trying to find a space, when she heard the most unnerving and chilling sound she had ever heard. It sounded like a knife carving into a tree, but it was much, much more sinister. At first, she brushed it off thinking it was one of her friends, just playing a joke. Plus, she was incredibly wasted anyways. She kept walking, but then she heard it again. Only this time, it was louder. Whoever was making that sound was laughing too. The laugh was just faint enough where you might miss it if you weren't paying attention. But it was terrifying. It was obvious to her that someone was trying to get her attention because the sound stopped suddenly when the person realized she had noticed. She looked around confused for a couple seconds until it hit her. She saw something moving in the trees a couple feet away from her, like someone was crouched down so that she wouldn't see them, but there was still what sounded like a scratching noise against the tree bark. That sobered her up fast, and she reached for the knife in her pocket, only to remember she had left it in her purse, which was in her tent. She was completely crippled with the realization of what was happening. She couldn't move, until she had remembered the flashlight that she had taken out there with her. Automatically, the air around her illuminated, and in the distance, she saw the steel metal of what looked like a machete glimmering against the light emerging from the bushes. Whoever was out there was taunting her. Again, she stood frozen in fear at what she was seeing. Then, the metal had started to shift, as if the person was moving towards her, and my mom bolted back to the campsite. When she finally found her friends, she ran into her tent and retrieved the pocket knife. I don't know how she planned on defending herself in a machete to pocket knife fight, but I think she just clinged on to what protection she could. Her friends were trying to calm her down. Her boyfriend said he'd go out and get whoever was out there, but she protested, and eventually, Everything went back to the way it was, except nobody went into the woods to use the bathroom, and my mom didn't sleep at all that night. The next day, the teens had woken up to police sirens and tape surrounding their camp. Some police officers had led them to a path that led up to the main road. My mom cried as she hugged my grandparents when she saw them. Everyone gave their statements, and the police informed them that the man that was out there had more than likely traveled to the spot after killing a high school principal and attempting to kill his wife in a neighboring town a few hours before. Apparently, the guy had shot through the door to their house and killed the principal. 
He ran off after that and traveled down to the lake. That's where he ran into my mom. While the police were searching the area, they found a machete laying on the ground, two hunting knives taped to nearby trees, a bowie knife, some energy pills, and a bottle of Jameson next to what looked like dried vomit in the grass. They assumed that the person had crouched in the bushes a few yards from where my mom and her friends were partying. The police assumed that the man had crouched in the bushes a few yards from where my mom and her friends were partying and just waited for someone to come into the woods. At that point, he planned to attack them. During the trials, they found out the man was planning on these killings for months. He was apparently into the occult and other satanic stuff like that. This event traumatized my mom for years. Now, my story. Thirty years later, my mom had driven me and my friends to the mall to celebrate my 14th birthday. We went through the day having fun, playing hide-and-seek in Sears. I know, it's lame, but there are so many places to hide in there, and we were shopping as well. It was a good time. That night, however was a different story. My mom had just dropped us back off at home, and I remember asking her if we could go to the park, which was only a block away from my house. All of my friends were planning on staying with me that night anyways, so it's not like anyone had a curfew. A little context. I'm a guy, and most of my friends were girls at the time. My mom agreed to let us go, as long as we took our cell phones and headed home at an appropriate time. The night was cool and chilled, and we stood hanging off the playground equipment, telling scary stories. They were all basic, run-of-the-mill stories about some stupid girl being stalked by a crazy psycho on Friday the 13th, and stuff like that, which now that I think of it, sounds kind of like what happened to my mom, I guess. So none of us were really scared. Then I had told them all the story of what happened to my mom. None of them really took me seriously, until my friend Nicole reminded us of the murders that happened around the same time. She then reminded us that the killer, who had kind of become a figment of local folklore in our town, had been released on probation. We were all thoroughly freaked out by that fact, but it was made even worse when one of my other friends, Brandon, noticed something from the road. Uh, guys? We all looked up to see a black truck, I couldn't tell the make or model, starting to head down the street, parallel to us. Now, our park is more of just a large square plot with streets facing each side of it, so cars passing by was not a strange occurrence. But usually, those cars would just turn onto another street off of the perimeter of the plot. This one didn't do that. The truck had entered the square on the street that was facing us, and we watched it as it turned onto all of the four streets surrounding. He wasn't going the speed limit either. He was just cruising like he was watching us. Now, like I said, this town was small, so when a car circles around like that, it's usually just some high school kids looking to smoke some weed and chill out or something and making sure no one was around to see but no one ever really wants to know what goes down when those cars stop. But like I said, this guy was going so much slower than he should have been. Plus it was like midnight, and it just didn't feel right. At that moment, we all agreed that the situation was just too creepy, and it was probably best to get out of there and head on back to my house. That's when the truck stopped on the same side of the road that we noticed it on. The guy's truck was parked almost right in front of the turn to the street, where my house is. So we decided to go the opposite way and just circle back around to my block so we wouldn't have to pass the truck. But that's when I heard a demanding voice yell at us from the driver's seat. I couldn't get a good glimpse of him, but from what I could see, he was a man that looked to be somewhere around my mom's age. All he said was, Ian! Come on, boy, get in. It's late. Thinking that he was probably just looking for a dog or something, we all just kept walking. Ian, 
I said, get in the truck, boy. He shouted again. That really just confused the crap out of us. I looked back at all my friends just to make sure. It was just Nicole, Brandon, Sarah, Jenna, and me. No Ian. At that moment, I shouted back to him. We don't know any Ian, sir. None of us are named Ian. Silence. Then the creep started to get out of his truck. And that was it. Nicole and I bolted out of there, not really looking back to see if any of our friends were following us. We ran straight from my house, and as the man saw us run, he got back in his truck and slammed the door. We ran right past him, which was a stupid thing to do in retrospect, but it was just a straight shot to my house after that. I could feel the air tightening in my lungs as I raced back to my house. I'm pretty sure I never ran that fast in my life. I probably should have waited for some of my friends to join, to make sure they were okay. But I just assumed they were right behind us. When we reached my house, I locked the door, and I told Nicole to get my mom and dad, and a couple of knives from our kitchen. Honestly, that was probably a bit of an overreaction, but I was very scared, and I just thought it was so bizarre that that weirdo thought it would be necessary to get out of his truck to just talk to us. My mom and dad calmed us down. Nothing ever came of it that night, but I'm pretty sure none of us got any sleep. That night, I kept having an awful feeling. I thought about the trauma that my mom had gone through all those years ago, feeling like there might have been some kind of connection to what just happened to me. It all seemed too weird. The next morning, my fears were realized. I was scrolling through my Facebook feed on my phone when I found an article on a local Crime Stoppers page. It read, Glenn Miller, local serial killer, set to be released on parole on December 12th. That was roughly three weeks before my birthday. My heart stopped as I kept reading. Apparently, after he was released, as the article explained, he had went to live with his son, who his girlfriend had given birth to after he was arrested. His name was Ian, and there was a picture of him standing next to a black truck. I know this had to be some kind of sick coincidence, but I could not shake the feeling that this was the truck that we had all seen that night. This incident still terrifies me today. This happened years ago, when I was 19. I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then, I was living 600 miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week, and we were still really close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive and I had a 10-year-old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up, but still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up, so they offered me a deal. I would stop at a rest stop every 2-3 to three hours and stretch my legs and call them, and in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I didn't call within the 3-hour window, though, they would assume I'd been in an accident and call me repeatedly, interrupting the audiobook or podcast that I would have on. I accepted the deal. And that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45 a.m. This was actually one of their nicer stops. It was well lit. Multiple vending machines that didn't have huge cages around them. The payphone wasn't broken, and it actually looked clean. There were a couple cars there with people sleeping in them. I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched, and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. Miss, can I ask you a favor? I turned around and he was leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I didn't see him when I parked. But there he was, 
uncomfortably close to me. He looked like he was in his 40s, maybe. He didn't look dirty or twitchy. He was just too close. His body language didn't scream threatening. And even though I was 19 years old, barely 5 feet tall, and at that point in my life, 110 pounds, and even though I had already binged a lot of true crime media, and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night with an out-of-state license plate, my dumbass asked what he wanted. He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck, and if he could just borrow my phone real quick to call his friend. It would just take a second, and it would really help him out. And I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him, and then I looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit, and this guy looked really normal, except for his eyes. He had dead, black, shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. I got that feeling right away, that runaway feeling. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help. So I put on my best customer service smile and told him, Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, but I don't have a charger and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone. And I need that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now. But good luck. And I turned and walked about 20 feet away. And he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning against my car, watching me. Now, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car, because he creeped me out, and he had serial killer eyes. So going to the bathroom is out. But I also wanted to get away from him. Technically, I could get into my car, but I would have to get really close to him, unless I went through the passenger side door and then crawled over the seat. He's not moving. So this is what I did. I called my dad, and my dad, for the first time that night, didn't answer the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still hadn't moved. He's still just staring at me. So I faked a phone conversation with my dad. I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I had actually hung up the phone, and loudly said that I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality, I was about four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple visible security cameras. The guy still doesn't move, and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation. In the years since, I've thought a lot of things I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out and my mind went blank. So I just hung up the phone. I didn't know what to do. I had hoped the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still just leaning against my car. I stalled for another couple minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a little. At this point, he's been leaning against my car staring at me for at least ten minutes. I honestly debated walking up to one of the men sleeping in their parked cars and asking them for help. I decided to stop stalling and head back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm not going to pretend that he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my door before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He is stranded here unless he can call his friend to bring the spare key. He's not angry or begging. His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but he had been creepily watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I'm not falling for it. I almost pointed out the working payphone, just in case I'm wrong about this, but then he leaned forward as I was getting in my car, and I lost all nerve and slammed and locked the door as fast as I could. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse, and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even put my seatbelt on, I was so focused on getting away from him, and then halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me. My mom, who would freak out if I didn't pick up, 
and it was already sick, and I needed to put on my seatbelt. I could still see him in my mirror. He was standing right next to where I was parked, with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone, but I kept my engine running, and I kept watching him. I don't want my mom to worry, so I told her everything is fine, where I am, and my ETA. Now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like I had overreacted. She scolded me about speeding, and I tune her out, because the guy started moving. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watch the guy walk to a truck, unlock the door, and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seem to be an issue for him, I guess. I watch the truck head back to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine to not upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes, and when I did, I didn't speed. I didn't want to see that truck again. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking, and that girls who look like they don't live nearby, or maybe look like they are living out of their cars, tend to be targets. I'm not sure what the intentions were of that man, but I'm pretty sure he was trying to get my phone from me so that I couldn't call for help. My friends and I used to urbex a lot, and for those of you who may not know, urbex means urban exploring, which is pretty much exploring abandoned places. We did it a lot. Literally any opportunity that we had to go, we did. This one weekend was... different. It was on a Friday night, and my friend DJ called me excited about this place that he had found about 45 minutes away. At that time, I was with this girl that I really liked, Miranda. She had never been able to go with us, but this time she was, and she was super excited. So we packed a couple of backpacks with the essentials, flashlights, face masks, first aid kits, and all of that. DJ picked us up around 6 p.m., along with three other friends, Matt, Jesse, and my good friend Babs. It was a 45 minute drive and on the way there, DJ explained where we were going. Apparently, there was a small abandoned neighborhood in the mountains. We were following the instructions that DJ's coworker gave him. Turn right at the fork in the road. Drive straight until you come up to a patchy spot on the left. Park there and walk until you come to a gate. Step over it and just keep walking until you come to an arch. That's how you know you're in the neighborhood. Although it was a 40 minute walk, which surprisingly didn't wear us out because we were so excited, we finally found the arch and passed through it. And what we saw was a legit neighborhood. There were old houses everywhere. You couldn't even see where the roads divided. We started going into some of them. One of them had a children's room where clothes were still hanging up. And judging from that, this neighborhood was from the 20s or 30s. Eventually, we lost track of time, and it was dark. I mean the type of darkness that hurt your eyes, because they just can't adjust to it. At that point, it was almost 11 p.m. We didn't want to make the 40-minute walk back and drive another 45 minutes back home. We had no choice but to spend the night in one of these houses. We found one though. Babs had a bunch of blankets with her, so we decided to sleep on them. I got the biggest one for Miranda and me to sleep on, and within minutes, we were all fast asleep. I woke up, I'd say around 3 a.m., to this overwhelming sense of dread. Miranda woke up too, asking me if I felt it. I asked her how long she had been up, like an hour, she said. I got up to get water from my backpack, and I felt like somebody was watching me. Instantly, I felt very uneasy. Miranda dug through her bag, got out a lighter, 
and we lit what was left of the fireplace. Come to find out, everyone else was awake too. DJ sat up and was like, yeah, earlier I got up to take a piss, and when I turned around, something walked by the doorway. Just as he finished saying that, Jessie comes running in like a bat out of hell. She stopped to catch her breath. There is someone buried in the backyard. We all looked at her like she was insane. Oh, don't believe me? Come look. She takes off out the back door. She was right. Right there in the backyard was someone's decrepit wooden grave marker. Bab started freaking out. Guys, look at the dirt. Someone wasn't buried here. Someone was dug up here. Needless to say, we all left very quickly. We all ran back into the house and started to pack everything. Then, that back door just slammed clean off its hinges. There was a point where we all froze and listened, and we heard footsteps, unmistakably shuffling, and the creepiest of all, what sounded like someone taking a brush through long, nappy hair. After that, we grabbed only our wallets and keys and ran out of the house. All of our stuff is still there to this day. The blankets, backpacks, flashlights, and first aid kits. I think Jessie left her camera behind too. And the fact that someone dug up a dead body in their backyard gives me the creeps to this day. Sometimes I get the urge to find that place again and see if our stuff is still there. But the thought of having to feel that nauseating dread again makes me think twice. I still urbex to this day. This story happened to me when I was about 14 years old. We grew up in a middle class neighborhood in San Diego, California. We lived in one of those neighborhoods where everybody knew everyone. I have memories of me, my older brother and sister biking in our cul-de-sac with the other neighborhood kids, playing tag and hopscotch, very traditional and happy childhood memories. But as the neighborhood children grew older and some even moved away, the vibe of our neighborhood street shifted. It was well known that one of the houses at the end of the cul-de-sac had recently become inhabited by druggies and other sketchy looking people. I just knew that I'd better be home when the street lights came on, since the residents of this strange house liked to hang out in their garage in the evenings, and they really creeped me out. Up until the night of my story, no other strange occurrences involving the residents of this home had ever took place. But I was definitely uncomfortable knowing that there were such sketchy people hanging around my once leave it to beaver type of neighborhood. During this time, I had the duty of watching my infant nephew William in the evenings while my sister worked. She would typically come home around 10 p.m. or so. It was an ordinary night, around 6 p.m. I think. I had just finished my homework and was watching TV while I rocked my nephew to sleep, and I would shortly fall asleep soon after since I had school the next morning. I was probably only asleep for about two hours when I was suddenly awakened by my sister. In a shrill voice, she screamed, Desiree, Desiree, wake up! Wake up! Super startled, and in a daze, I woke up in a panic. My sister continued, There was a crazy person in the house when I got here. Needless to say, I was shocked and confused. After finally comprehending what she said, I finally blurted out, Oh my gosh, where's William? Is he okay? All I could imagine was a druggie creeping up on my precious nephew and stealing him while I slept. My eyes darted to my sleeping nephew, resting on the bed where I had left him. After realizing my nephew was safe and sound, my sister began to tell me what was going on downstairs while my nephew and I slept upstairs. My sister had come home from her shift around 10 p.m., where she went straight to the kitchen and began to make some dinner. While she was preparing her food, she noticed someone walk into my grandma's room 
which was right next to the kitchen. She didn't give it much thought, since we lived in a house with nine people, which was my extended family, my aunties, cousins, uncles, etc. It was about three minutes that passed before the person who walked into my grandma's bedroom walked back out. To my sister's horror, this person was not a family member, nor was it anyone she had ever seen before. It was a middle-aged, disheveled-looking woman. She was murmuring and talking to herself in Spanish, followed by random giggles and bursts of laughter as she walked through our kitchen. Who are you? What are you doing in our house? My sister shouted at the woman. The woman ignored her and continued to giggle and talk to herself as she made her way into the living room. Once she entered, she sat down on my grandpa's rocking chair and began rocking back and forth, still murmuring and laughing to herself in the creepiest way imaginable. I don't know who you are, but you need to leave right now, shouted my sister. Still, the crazy woman ignored my sister, like she was in her own world, and my sister did not even exist. My sister then starts to yell for my brother and uncle to help, since she could not get through to her. My brother and uncle quickly come into the living room and begin shouting at her, telling her to get out of our house or they would call the cops. Again, the woman ignores them and continues the private conversation with herself. At this point, my uncle grabs the woman by her shoulders while my brother grabs her by the feet, and they begin to carry her out of the house towards the front door. At this point, the woman realizes she is being forced out of the house and starts to scream at the top of her lungs like a banshee. My brother and uncle ignored her screams and continued to walk towards the front door. As they passed the staircase, the woman latched onto our banister, screaming and holding on for dear life. My brother loosens her grip by removing her fingers from the wooden banister one by one. Finally, they push her out the door, slam it, and lock it. The woman disappears into the night. During this entire ordeal, the police were called, but by the time they arrived, there were no signs of the woman. Nothing like this had ever happened to us before, so needless to say, everyone in the household was completely floored and was just happy that the lady did not harm anyone. We were all very confused as to how she even got into the house, considering my sister had just came home and remembers locking the door behind her. We found out that my six-year-old cousin heard knocking at the door and opened it for the lady without even asking who she was. My uncle gave him a chewing out. He said he was sorry and that he assumed it was one of my sister's friends. When my grandma woke up from the commotion of the police coming to our home, she shared that she actually remembered waking up to the strange lady at the foot of her bed Remember previously, I had said that my sister saw someone walk into my grandma's room before shortly seeing the lady walk back out. While at the foot of my grandma's bed, the lady picked up my grandma's poodle and was hugging and cuddling it while giggling. My grandma was weirded out, but she also assumed it was a guest of my sister's and went back to sleep. Luckily, we never heard from that woman again. A few weeks later, however, I was telling one of my neighborhood friends about the strange ordeal. She then told me that her mom had called the cops on a woman walking naked down our street, just a week or two after the incident with the lady and my family. The lady was resisting arrest and became irate when she was being handcuffed. We are not certain if the intruder in my home and the naked woman were connected, but that was the year that my family also ended up moving out of our once safe neighborhood. I live a rather normal life. Nothing interesting or concerning ever really happens to me. After reading and listening to many of these stories, I realized I do have one of my own. This occurred during the summer of 2017. I was working two jobs at the time. I would lifeguard for a six hour day shift and another six hour night shift at an ice cream place. 
with very few days off. So this incident occurred at the ice cream place. The location of this place was in a pretty sketchy area. Drug deals daily, even from within the store. The staff was mostly female, but this night I was working with a new guy who had just finished training. I was exhausted from dealing with people 12 hours a day, every day, so I took the opportunity to make him work the front register. I took over the drive through which was pretty quiet during the night shift, and spent most of the night cleaning. The shop was usually empty later in the night, so I didn't think the new guy, let's call him Nathan, would need much help. So I was surprised when he came around to the back where I was washing dishes with a confused and concerned look on his face. I asked if he needed help with anything, and he replied, Um, there's a guy out there covered in blood. This freaked me out, and my mouth dropped open. I quickly recovered and told him to finish the dishes while I took care of it. As I walked around to the front, my thoughts had returned to normal, and I assumed Nathan had just overreacted and maybe mistook paint for blood. As I walked up to the register, I kindly greeted the man. He was tall and well-built. He looked like he had a hard life and was middle-aged. Yes, it was blood, I confirmed. I scanned over him, also looking for wounds, thinking he might be injured. But I couldn't find anything to support that thought. He ordered a cup of chocolate ice cream with rainbow sprinkles, which I thought was odd for one lone man covered in blood. But that's none of my business. All I could think was how I wanted him to leave, and I made his order quickly. I placed it in front of him, instead of handing it to him as to avoid touching his bloody hands. I smiled at him, feeling very uneasy. This guy's aura was sending off bad vibrations. To my dismay, he took a seat at the counter to eat his ice cream. I darted to the back and sent Nathan to the front, because I didn't want to be alone with this guy. After finishing up the closing duties, I walked back to the front. I saw Nathan talking to his mom, who had come to pick him up, as he was young and didn't have his own car. The man was gone. I asked his mom if she had seen him, and she said yes. She confirmed that he was in fact covered in blood. But when she asked him about it, he said it was paint in an aggressive tone, before hurrying to leave. I joked around saying, Sounds like something someone covered in blood would say. His mom didn't smile or think that was funny. She just said that she knew what blood looked like, and we all had no doubt that he was lying. Thinking back on all this, I should have just asked him to leave, because it was definitely a major health hazard, or maybe even called the cops on him, but I had been too afraid to upset him, fearing that my blood might decorate him next. A true story. This happened about 13 years ago, when I was a sophomore in college, attending a liberal arts school in Suffolk County, New York. Within the first month or two of freshman year, I had found myself in a very tight-knit group of fellow theater geeks. Six guys, myself included, and one girl. And they all loved horror movies and ghost stories. I had found my crew. Freshman year was tough, but we all held each other up and made the whole experience more enjoyable for one another. At the beginning of sophomore year, we decided that in October, as the Halloween season was ramping up, we would find a creepy wooded spot in a nearby town some night and scare the crap out of ourselves. And that's precisely what happened. We did some research and found that there was a particularly isolated area about 30 minutes away infamous for paranormal sightings. Perfect. The seven of us split into two different cars and headed out into the night. Allow me to set the scene. You turn off a busy main road, flooded with strip malls and restaurants and whatnot, and you were almost immediately greeted 
by complete darkness. Again, this area was very heavily wooded. It was essentially a large web of winding roads surrounded by trees. Very few streetlights and very few houses. Without a GPS or a good sense of direction, one could very easily get lost in there. We all just made sure to have fully charged phones and flashlights just in case. But the goal was to keep driving until we collectively decided to pull over and go exploring. So per the directions, we made a left off the main road, driving for 30 minutes or so into this dark network, picking directions at random, just getting intentionally lost. Our cars made a turn, and, to our surprise, there was a huge log in front of us, turned on its side. We had reached a dead end of some kind, with nothing but trees beyond it. We all got out to see what exactly this was, stepped over the log, and noticed two narrow trails leading in different directions. This seemed like as good a time as any to grab our flashlights and do some amateur ghost hunting. We flipped a coin and set off on the trail to the right. The trail was so narrow that we had to walk single file to avoid getting whacked by branches. For whatever reason, I ended up in the back. I'm usually pretty rational and level-headed, but I have to say, the further we went in, the more I was overcome with an uneasy feeling. I kept hearing sounds deep in the woods, unable to shake the feeling that someone was watching us. But I seemed to be the only one who heard these things, so I shrugged it off as my imagination. And, in any case, the whole point of us being there was to get scared, not to mention the fact that we were seven able-bodied college students. What would we come across that could take us down? We headed down this trail for about 20 minutes, and just when I thought it would never end, we came to a massive clearing, and I mean massive. It was a large, open field of unkept grass, comparable in scope to a golf course, but not nearly as well manicured. Trees surrounded the entire field, which was so large, we could not see the end of it from where we were standing. I was thrilled to get out of the narrow trail, but I don't think any of us were expecting to find an area so vast. One of us looked to the right and said, Hey, check that out. We all turned, and there was an old, dilapidated house several hundred yards away. The house was completely dark, with no cars or signs of anyone actually living there. We walked over and shined our flashlights at it, and sure enough, the windows and doors were all boarded up. I managed to peer between the boards on one of the windows, and what I could see was an old white couch covered in plastic but an otherwise empty room. Whoever used to live there, they were long gone. Because there was no way in, and because we all felt sufficiently creeped out by the house anyway, we decided to walk closer to the trail we had come from, have a seat in the field, and figure out where to go next. We walked towards the narrow trail, but before we could sit, my friend Mark stopped what he was doing. His expression dropped, and he pointed. We all turned, and on a very far side of the field, directly across from where we had come in, we could see someone tall, lanky, and pale, dancing among the trees. And by dancing, I mean he was skipping around, grabbing a tree, swinging around it, and then doing the same to another tree. Basically a do -si do The moon was so bright in the woods so dark. It actually took a second for us to really understand what we were looking at. Jay, the 6'4 skeptic of the group, wasn't seeing it. I leaned into him, pointed in that direction, and said, Jay, look where I'm pointing. Don't you see him? He squinted a bit, and the second that he did, he gasped with everything he had, clutched my arm, and whispered, what the hell is that? What happened next sent shockwaves through all of us. Whoever this was, they stopped dancing, 
looked in our direction and started sprinting towards us. Without even thinking, we freaked out and ran back to the trail. Yet again, Jay was the only one who didn't see what was happening. He shouted after us, Guys, what's going on? Where are you going? After about 15 seconds of running like hell, I heard Jay scream, Oh my god! I looked back and saw his flashlight following the rest of us into the trail. While the walk into the woods took about 20 minutes, we made it back to our two cars, hopped in, and were peeling away in less than five. Once we were a safe distance away, we pulled over, got out, and checked in with each other about what just happened. My heart was pounding, and I know everyone else was feeling the same way. Nearly 15 years later, we are all still friends, living in different states, yet keeping touch through marriages, divorces, children, etc. But occasionally, out of the blue, one of us will send a group text to the others with something to the effect of, the woods. That really happened, right? It most certainly did. That experience is always in the back of my mind, and I'm pretty sure it always will be. Here's the thing that still resonates with me about that night. Whoever that was, they were dancing maniacally in the woods at one o'clock in the morning, and then ran directly for a group of young adults, not at all phased by the fact that they were severely outnumbered. Did he know that we were there from the second we parked? Was he the sound that I kept hearing when we walked the trail? Whatever the case may be, when he came for us that night, you can be sure none of us wanted to stick around and see what he was truly capable of. As any parent can tell you, Leaving your children home with a babysitter is one of the hardest things you can do. Fortunately for my husband and I, we have a really amazing babysitter. She watches our kids whenever we need her. It can be for 20 minutes because we are late getting home from work, or an entire weekend. It's also worth noting that my husband and I travel sometimes for our jobs. Our babysitter lives next door, and I've known her since she was born. She's a very sweet 18-year-old girl who will be starting at university pre-med in the fall. She finished towards the top of her class and plans on becoming an orthopedic surgeon. Needless to say, I trust her with my two children, who are six and four years old, respectively. Like many Saturday nights, my husband and I had work functions to go to, and like many times before, we called our trusty babysitter and she of course accepted and was happy to help. We left at about 7.30 p.m., and as we pulled out of the driveway, I noticed that the garage door was slightly ajar. Now my husband is the super anal type and never leaves doors open like that. He also has all of his tools and whatnot in that garage, so I knew he wouldn't just leave it open like that. But I thought, whatever, it's probably just the wind that pushed it open. As the night went on, I began to feel more and more uneasy. I couldn't quite explain it. I decided that I needed to check on my children. It was summertime, and the sun was just starting to set about 8.45 p.m. I got a hold of the babysitter after only one or two rings. She said they'd just finished some hot dogs and were going to be settled down and watch a movie for the night. I admit, this gave me some comfort but I still couldn't shake this feeling that something wasn't right. I called back a minute later and asked if she could check out the side window and tell me if the garage door was shut. She told me it was. I double-checked and asked if it was shut or just mostly shut, and she said no, it's definitely shut. As we hung up the phone, I didn't feel right at all. In fact, I felt sick to my stomach. I asked my husband if we could go home. He complied with a little convincing. I could tell he was slightly annoyed, but he would do anything for me. I called back a third time in the car, and for the first time in years of watching my kids, 
She didn't answer. I called back again, and again, no answer. As we approached the house, my heart fell into my stomach. I noticed that the side garage door was now wide open. As my husband turned into the driveway, my uneasiness turned into terror. There was a man climbing into the kitchen window. He turned and looked at us in the driveway like a deer in headlights. He was a rough-looking man, maybe mid-twenties. He had a scruffy beard and a hood over his head. His teeth were yellow and his eyes bloodshot and had not one but two knives hanging out of his back pockets. I was frozen in fear. My husband wasted no time and got out of the car and chased him down. He caught the man and held him down. I called the police and they arrived in minutes. I went inside to find my babysitter in the basement with my children. She had candles lit and weird relic-like symbols all around. When she saw me, she just started to chant and laugh hysterically. The cops were called and thankfully arrived quickly, eventually arresting her and the man. Thankfully my children were safe and unharmed. What the cops told me after the situation still gives me a sickening feeling. Apparently, my young babysitter met this man at the end of the school year. They started using drugs and experimenting with satanic rituals. The documents later recovered with the ritualistic items included text, stating two sacrifices were required. They were going to sacrifice my kids. They also told me that this man was probably living in my garage for about a week or so, given the food and urine they found stored in the crawl space in the garage. I have since done everything possible to pursue charges to the furthest extent of the law. We have also moved to my mother's house until we can find another area to move to. It just goes to show you that you can never trust the babysitter. My husband and I went camping for the first time ever in Arizona as a part of our long trip out west. I had picked out this really cool place that was on a mountain overlooking a beautiful landscape. It's next to a cliff and in a really isolated location. I'm talking like 20 miles out on gravel roads in the middle of a national forest. So we get there and set up our tent and hike a little bit and take pictures of the surrounding area. We see a few cars parked around two tents and decide to stop and talk to the other campers nearby because we had heard that there was going to be a bad storm that night. These were four guys who were from Arizona and they told us not to worry because the storms didn't get that terrible around this area. That was all the persuading that we needed to stay. Later on, while walking a bit further down the campsite, we see a woman there with her dog and another old lady. We smile and wave and continue to hike down a bit further into the forest. Let me elaborate that because of the storm, we are one among maybe a total of seven campers that decided to stay and withstand the night. We watch the sunset when we get back to our site, make sure our car was only a few yards away and go into our tent when it gets too dark to see. There are no stars tonight due to the storm clouds and it hasn't begun to rain yet so we decide to try to sleep right away so that we could possibly sleep through the storm when it does hit. It is an insanely windy night, so it is hard to sleep, but eventually we get a bit of shut-eye. I wake up at 10.30 p.m. to the sound of some crazy thunder rolling through the mountains and rain hitting down on our tent. I'm a little freaked out because they get a lot of flash floods out here, and I don't want to fall off at the side of the cliff. 
I tell myself to try to sleep and eventually I doze off again. It's 12 a.m. and I wake up again. This time because I hear something heavy hitting the side of our tent. Like full on sounded like someone could have been punching our tent and sliding something down the side of it. I open my eyes and can't see anything. It's completely dark, no light whatsoever. The sound continues every couple of minutes and at this point I'm crapping bricks. Suddenly, I hear footsteps right next to my side of the tent. They're slow but steady. I feel my entire body freeze up. I seriously start thinking about how this is it and I'm going to die. My heart is beating so fast that I'm certain whatever is out there can hear it. Then whatever it is lets out a deep sigh right on the opposite side of the tent. I'm thinking it is a bear and realizing that I might actually have to face this thing. So in a desperate call for my husband's mind reading powers, I squeeze his hand really hard repetitively and he wakes up. But instead of reading my mind, he blurts out, what's wrong? Why are you squeezing my hand? Right when he says this, the footsteps stop. I don't hear the footsteps again. So after a while, I break out of my frozen state and tell him what I heard. We decided it may have been an animal passing by. But whatever is hitting our tent continues every so often and I'm starting to go a little insane from it, wondering what is going on. We convince ourselves that it's just pines falling from the trees above us and try to sleep again. We just need to make it through one night, then we can laugh about all of this in the morning. A couple of minutes go by and suddenly the tent caves in on my husband's side right on his head. He whispers that it feels like something is pushing the tent down and I feel my heart instantly sink. I'm freaking out, thinking it's a bear that just sat on his head, but he decides to push back and we hear the familiar noise of something sliding off of our tent that we've been hearing for the past few hours. We then realize that it's been snowing outside and that the noise we heard hitting our tent was heavy ice falling from the trees. Our tent is covered in thick ice and my husband pushes the tent from inside until all of the ice slides off. Still determined to make it through the night and a little relieved that it was just ice and not a bear, we try to sleep and make it to sunrise. We keep on a small light that my husband luckily brought with him just to calm us down a little. Things are starting to seem normal again and we both close our eyes. It's 3 a.m. at this point, not even 30 minutes after we are settling down, my literal worst nightmare happens. Out of the pitch black night, we hear a woman screaming. We distinctly hear her say, oh my God, followed by some other non-tangible words that sound something like help. The way that she screams doesn't sound like anger. It sounds like pure terror and a sense of panic. My husband and I are both frozen looking at each other. I quickly shut off our light and start panicking and asking what we should do because how is this really happening right now? While we are trying to decide what to do for the next few minutes, we hear her again. But this time she's screaming, no, 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 no as we hear a car speed off into the night. I'm in tears at this point. We have no idea what is happening. It's dead silent now, save for the icy rain hitting our tent. It definitely sounded like she wasn't in the car, but 
more like she was desperately yelling after it or begging not to be hurt. And this, this was my breaking point. Because I could take the bad weather. I could take the possible bear outside my tent. I could even take the ice falling on our heads in one of the warmest states in America. But one thing I cannot and will not ever be able to handle is a screaming person in the middle of the pitch black woods at 3 a.m. We decide to get out of there and even contemplate leaving our tent and booking it to our car. But instead we try to stay level-headed and grab our valuables and put them in the car first. We frantically gather our things and stay close as we shuffle to our car. I close the door and keep the lights off for a while, scared to attract any unwelcome visitors. While my husband goes back to grab the tent, I start the car and call 911. I tell them what I heard and where we are, and they say that they are sending someone to the campsite to make sure everything is okay. Only thing is, we are literally in the middle of nowhere, and it will definitely take them more than an hour to arrive. Not to mention, the storm left those gravel roads in some pretty terrible conditions. So my husband and I decide to start driving, and it's like 3.30 a.m. now. As we drive out of the campsite, my husband notices one last eerie detail that stuck with me. The four guys that we had talked to earlier had left. All three of their cars were gone, while their tents remained. Whatever scared them off, they sure left in a hurry. It was only after we started driving that the thought occurred to me. Whatever was walking next to my tent may not have been an animal. It very well could have been someone lurking around in the dark who decided to go after the girl we had seen previously on our hike. I'm not quite sure what went down on that lone mountain that night, and I hope that everyone got out okay. This happened to me over 30 years ago, but I remember the feeling of fear as if it were yesterday. I was in college, taking a course in outdoor survival. The course ended with a three-day, three-night wilderness solo. We were allowed to take a backpack, empty canteen, sleeping bag, knife, six matches, rope, a sheet of plastic, and a small cooking pot and spoon. We were not allowed to bring food or water since part of our training was in identifying edibles and finding a water source. Once I was dropped off, I had to hike in and find a spot to set up camp. First, I had to place a flag on a tree near my drop-off point so that I could be located three days later for pickup. I was loving life, just me in nature. I had no fears, even as night began to fall. I enjoyed the sounds of the woods all around me and didn't mind not having a tent. I built a small fire and had a great feeling of peace. I slept well that night, but woke up thirsty. My search for a water source began. Happily, I found a muddy stream, let the water settle in my pot, placed the halazone tablets in the water, and boiled it for good measure. It tasted horrible, but at least I was hydrated. All went well and I had a great time. Until my last day. It was early afternoon on the last day and time to break camp. I cleaned up my camp area and hiked out to my drop-off spot. As I sat, leaning against a tree, I heard the sound of a vehicle off in the distance. I figured that it had to be my pickup. As I waited, 
a vehicle that I had never seen before pulled up on the dirt path in front of me. Immediately, I realized that I did not know the man who was driving. He gave me an odd look. My gut told me that he was bad news. He asked what I was doing there and if I was alone. I said that my friends were behind me breaking camp. He gave me a knowing look, got back in his vehicle and rode off. I knew that I had to hide and fast. I ran into the woods and hid. As I ran, I heard the car coming back. I stayed as quiet as I could and remained hidden. I heard him get out of the car. I could hear him calling to me and walking through the brush looking for me. Eventually, he gave up and I heard the car door slam, the engine start, and the car pull away. Going back to my drop-off point was not an option, so I began hiking through the woods, hoping I would find base camp. After walking for what felt like hours, I saw a forest ranger. I told him who I was and what had happened to me. He told me that I had done the right thing since a young woman had been assaulted the night before and the police and forest service had been searching the area. He drove me to the base camp where I learned that someone else in my class had a creepy encounter with a man the night before. She had scared him away by blowing a brass whistle until help arrived. If there's anything to be learned from this, it is being sure to always trust your gut feelings and never camp alone. Me and my boyfriend love to camp. About two weeks ago, we decided to go to the coast because we had a Friday off from our classes in university and decided to hike and camp out for the weekend. We had a three-day plan to stay in three different towns and hike to each place. This story is about the first place we stayed in. The first town was barely a town. It was more like a bunch of small houses and farmlands and very few people. Anyway, since there were five to six camping grounds available, one of which was highly recommended on TripAdvisor and the likes of, we didn't bother calling beforehand. We simply headed there and then straight to that camping area. Upon reaching it, we saw the gate open not really so unusual, but when we entered it, no one seemed to be there. We knocked and called out for someone, and no one responded. The outdoor bar was all open with expensive bottles of alcohol lined up, and food left on the kitchen table as we saw from the window, so they couldn't have gone far. My boyfriend found it a bit strange that they would leave everything open like that, but assuming it was a small community with no crime, we didn't think more. We went to some other camping grounds to ask if they are open. The first one we went to said they were closed because their grounds were very messy these days, but they recommended us another place. We asked them about the first ground we had went to and strangely, the man said don't go there. When we asked why, he said, eh, just don't. I don't really recommend you going there. The other place he told us about was also closed and luckily in the meantime, I found a signboard for the first place and it had their number on it. We called them and a man picked up and told us that he and his wife are out for a couple of hours but will be back by the evening. He said we could set up our camp and that we would meet later. The place was a bit secluded but it was quite picturesque and we set our camp and left. We spent the whole day exploring and hiking around and after a tiring day around 10pm after dinner 
started heading back. This is where things got extra creepy. When we got back, we found the place still empty. No one had returned and it was quite late. My boyfriend called up the owners again and they said they had decided not to return tonight but that we could leave money under a table mat by the bar. They said the kitchen and bathrooms are open if we need to use them. The place was dark and the yard where we had set the camp up was huge and without lighting. My boyfriend immediately started to feel a bit uneasy. He was concerned why two business owners would leave their property completely open to two total strangers with a bar full of unopened bottles and a half-open house. As we walked towards our camp, he kept subtly expressing his uneasiness and kept looking around. He's usually pretty calm, so I told him if he's really feeling so strongly about this, we can just go to the pension where we had dinner earlier and stay the night there in a hotel room. He opened the flashlight of his phone and kept looking around, getting more and more uneasy. We agreed to pack up our camp and leave. I began to pack it up since it requires a lot of folding and he was already anxious so I told him to just stand and give me light as I pack it up. Except constantly he would move the light and check the area. I kept getting irritated because I could sense his worry and at the same time I couldn't pack fast enough because I couldn't see. At one point he even told me in a slightly rude way to hurry it up. He still seemed super anxious and I told him to relax. Just telling this part gives me the chills all over again. The road back to the main area of the town was dark and lonely, and this is when he told me. There's something I wanted to say, but not while we were still in the grounds. Oh, what is it? I asked. He hesitated, and then he said he didn't want to freak me out, but he was sure that he saw someone lurking in the dark behind the wooden cabins and by the bathrooms. Twice. No one was supposed to be there except us. I got the chills, but I still tried to rationalize, saying it's a farm area, so there's lots of animals. Maybe a cat moving around. But he was adamant it was a human figure walking like a human would and standing. That's why he kept checking and wanted to hurry so much. And that's why he was telling me to hush up and keep my voice down. I almost had tears in my eyes at this point and the hair on my back was standing. I kept looking back and almost running at this point to the lighted area of the quiet town and only really relaxed when we reached the pension and booked a room there, got the key, locked and checked it twice. I'm generally a skeptical person but I really do believe my boyfriend didn't just see things. I don't know who that was back there or what could have happened, if anything. And I don't care to know. I live in a small county with a festival in May, and hog racing in June, and a curfew of 9 p.m. A few years ago, our county was shaken up due to multiple apparent overdoses. A few people were arrested that same month the overdoses happened. One of them was my older sister's boyfriend at the time, Jim. Jim was a dealer and cut his own stuff. Nobody knew what he put in it except for him, his runners, and my sister. It was laced with fentanyl, which is a pain medication. Taken in low doses, it causes death and it is fast acting. The addicts didn't know what was in the heroin, they just wanted a high. Jim and my sister, however, knew what they were selling to them. I didn't know what my sister was doing at first, 
until years later. I met someone at school and befriended them. We were both new to the school and neither of us had a lot of friends. We both had Facebook and naturally at that age we thought it was cool so we friended each other. This is when I found out her brother Tom passed away around the same time Jim was arrested. Not only that, but due to my younger brother having a birthday, my sisters and me took photos together and posted them on Facebook. My friends saw them and told me something that I never thought I would hear. Your sister was at my house the day Tom passed away. My heart dropped because I knew my sister helped kill all those people. It wasn't just Jim, and eventually I got my answer when Jim called us from jail. He didn't want her to go to jail because he loved her, because he cared for her. My sister promised that she would wait for him. Two months later, she latched onto another man who would eventually be found dead from apparent suicide. And after my dad passed away, she's gotten worse. She made death threats to us and wished death upon us for something out of our control. This happened earlier this year. It happened in the same cabin that my wife and I had that experience in a few years ago with the guys following us in our car. It's kind of a weird coincidence that I have another story to tell about the exact same place. So, as I mentioned before, my family owns a cabin in upstate New Hampshire and it is literally my favourite place in the world. It's on a small, very secluded lake, shared by only a few other cabins, one other cabin on my side, with six in total. Most of my neighbours only visit during the spring and fall months, and even then, it's pretty rare to run into one of them. We all pretty much leave each other to do our own thing, but we also try to look out for each other the best we can. When we occasionally check in on each other's property during off-season visits, just to be sure there haven't been any damages from storms or break-ins. We all try to be good neighbours, because the lake is a pretty popular fishing location in the area, and as a result of it being so secluded, it's not unusual to see people who don't live on lake out in a boat or hiking around with a fishing pole. In the winter, it becomes a popular place for ice fishing and snowmobiling. So again, it kind of reinforces why all of us who own the property on the lake try to look out for one another, as there are people coming and going at all times of the year. There have been a few break-ins on the lake over the last few years, but honestly, in the 30 years I've now been going up to the cabin, there have only been a handful. Occasionally, someone's canoe or kayak will go missing. But that's pretty much the worst of it, until this winter. My wife and I decided to take a long vacation at the cabin this winter. She was getting ready to start a new job, and I had leftover holiday time from the previous year, so we figured we should take the opportunity to get away before our schedule started, to get busy again in the spring. 
It was sort of an impromptu vacation. But once we got the idea of spending a week alone together, relaxing by the wood stove, drinking craft beer, winter hiking and binge watching DVDs, we couldn't get it out of our heads. Two weeks later, we were packed up in my father's F-150 and on the road. Things got wacky immediately. But first, there are a couple of things that you need to know about this location. The lake basically sits in the middle of a dead zone, as far as wireless reception goes. Sometimes you can randomly pick up a few bars of service, but never with certainty. The isolation and feeling of being unplugged is one of the main reasons I love going up to the cabin. It becomes a lot easier to not be glued to your phone when you physically can't be. Secondly, as I mentioned before, this place is secluded. It's a solid 10 minute drive before cell reception kicks in with any sort of consistency and about another five before you reach a town. A couple of years ago, and after much debate within the family, we decided to break down and get a satellite dish installed so we would have some connectivity to the outside world. We essentially have basic cable for news, weather and a phone line. However, my folks have the service suspended at the start of winter since our family rarely visits during those months. So my wife and I were heading up without a phone connection, but it had never been a problem before, so we didn't really think anything of it. It hadn't snowed too much in our area, but the ground was still covered in a few inches of old snow, and there were snowmobile tracks all over the place. Before reaching the final turnoff towards the cabin, you have to drive across a causeway, a more crossing. You get a really good view of both sides of the lake. It had been cold for a few weeks straight, so the lake was frozen over. And I looked out over the lake and saw what appeared to be two guys ice fishing, sitting on a picnic table out in the middle of our side of the lake. It was my neighbor's picnic table. I knew right away that it was his because of the very distinct paint job. This exact thing had actually happened before, and the last group of fishermen that did this left the table out on the ice, and it fell through once the lake started to thaw. So because of this, my neighbour had chained his new picnic table to concrete footing on the edge of his property. So that means these guys either broke the table to get it out onto the lake, or they broke the chain. I am also pretty confident that it wasn't my neighbour out on the ice, because he lives in Florida, doesn't fish, and never visits during the winter. This pissed me off. I say something along the lines of, Again? What the hell is their problem? To my wife. And she reciprocates in a similar fashion. Since both of us were in agreement, I sped up to get to the cabin and confronted them before they could run off. I didn't really have a plan, but I figured I would yell at them and threaten to call the cops if they didn't put it back, which I couldn't actually do. I kind of figured as soon as they saw the truck turn down the road, they would take off anyway. I was right, but oddly, more right than I knew. As I came down the road, I noticed a few things that struck me as odd. First, there were two dudes jumping onto and starting up snowmobiles that were parked in front of my neighbor's cabin. Second, the front door to the cabin was wide open. The lights were on, 
and there was smoke coming out of the chimney. I stopped the truck, about 50 feet from his driveway, and watched as the two guys drove their snowmobiles out onto the lake, picked up their buddies, and sped off across the lake into the woods. We kind of just sat there for a minute or so, dumbfounded. I wasn't really sure what was going on, but it definitely didn't feel right. I guess it was technically possible that my neighbour was visiting, or that maybe he rented his cabin out to some people, but my gut told me that this was not the case. There were no cars in his driveway, and the guys on the snowmobiles were definitely in some sort of hurry when we pulled up. Also, it was about 10 degrees outside, so why would they leave the door open? After snapping out of it, I parked the truck in front of our cabin and walked over to the edge of the lake. Sound travels pretty well out there, and I could hear the snowmobiles getting further and further away. I unlocked our cabin, threw a quick start log in the wood stove, and then my wife and I headed over to the neighbor's cabin with our dog. I called out hello a few times, and then I tried yelling for my neighbour, but got nothing back. As we got closer, I could clearly see the front door was splintered and had been pried open. My wife and I had unknowingly pulled up while people were actively breaking into my neighbour's cabin. Not exactly an ideal way to start a relaxing winter getaway. My family is on really good terms with my neighbours, so I went ahead and stepped inside to check it out. There was a fresh pile of wood by the stove, which was roaring, and the kitchen had some paper plates, food, empty beer cans, and cigarette butts strewn about. Nothing seemed broken or missing that I could tell, but the place was an absolute mess, and reeked of cigarettes. It was as if they just decided to help themselves and make my neighbour's cabin their own private fishing lodge for a while. There were some sleeping bags and a cooler in the living room, so it looked like they had been planning to stay for more than a day. I wasn't in the cabin for more than a minute or so, and I was careful not to touch anything. I did, however, snap a few pictures from my neighbours in the cops, and then, I snuffed out the wood stove, and I also decided to close the front door as best I could when I left, while wearing gloves, since we were going to have to leave in order to get in touch with the police and my neighbour, and I didn't want the front door being left wide open. The next couple of hours were pretty bunk. We drove into town, reported the break-in to the police, and after giving our report, we got in touch with my neighbour, who was understandably very upset. I did my best to assure him that things weren't too bad, all things considered, and that there would just be some cleaning up to do. I offered to do it, since we were going to be up there all week, but he insisted that he wanted to see it all for himself. He was going to make plans to fly up from Florida to deal with everything as soon as he could, but asked if I could nail a couple of boards across the broken door for now. The police were heading out to check the property. When we got back to our cabin, the police were already at my neighbours checking things out. One of them came over and asked if I could walk them through everything that happened. I retold the story, and ended it with something along the lines of, so I left after shutting down the stove and closed the door behind me. I got some weird looks, and then the conversation went something like this. Are you sure you closed the door? Because it was open when we got here. Yes, I definitely closed the door. Well, it was open, and the items you described aren't there either. The sleeping bags, the cooler, 
They aren't there, so it looks like they came back and got them. This was pretty unnerving for the same reason. Why risk coming all the way back for some sleeping bags and a cooler with getting away? After getting away, they wouldn't have known for certain that we did or didn't call the police right away. So the cops suspected that they were watching us then came back right after we left. Or that there was someone else in the area who we didn't see. I listened to the snowmobiles driving off and they got pretty far away. They kept going until I couldn't hear them anymore. And the woods on the other side of the lake, a completely untouched wilderness for a few miles. I know this because I hunt turkeys out there. So I personally think there was someone else close by watching us. My wife really liked that little bit of information. Especially since only a few years ago we had basically been followed by creepers on a previous trip to our cabin. The whole situation was just a giant downer. After a while the cops finished up and let us know that they would keep a cruiser in the area. Not that that would really help. And that they were going back to check on the other cabins for any signs of break-ins. I nailed my neighbour's door shut, dragged the picnic table off the ice, as they had cut the chain, and headed back inside for a much-needed beer. Or four. We had debated a little about cancelling the trip and heading back home for a staycation. But honestly, we were determined to enjoy our week because we had really been looking forward to it. So we decided to stay. The next couple of days were great. We did exactly what we planned on doing, which was mostly nothing. We watched movies, snuggled, drank in excess, and made my world famous chili and my wife ate it. We had bacon, eggs and mimosas for breakfast, beer, grilled cheese and mediocre red box movies for lunch, and vodka tonics, hearty winter meals and sexy times for dinner. It was awesome. Granted, every time we heard a snowmobile, we both gave each other an oh shit look. But after a few times we were joking about it and our oh shit looks morphed into a game of who can make the funniest face. We were just generally having a great time. As much as we were enjoying being completely overindulgent bed bunnies by midweek, we wanted to stretch our legs so we decided to go for a hike. It was a beautiful day and I knew the surrounding area very well. So I suggested we hike up to the dam at the mouth of the river that feeds the lake. It freezes over in winter and looks pretty cool. It was around a two or three hour hike round trip, depending on the place, short and sweet. We brought our dog along and again, we were having a great time enjoying the extremely scenic winter woods and each other's company. On our way back, things took an unfortunate turn. About two-ish miles, 30 minutes from the cabin, we hear the whine of snowmobiles. We each made a funny face and joked. Then it got quiet and we kept listening. They were getting closer. At the time, it wasn't exactly unexpected. It was a gorgeous day out, and we were smack dab in the middle of prime snowmobile territory. But given everything that had happened earlier that week, it was impossible not to feel at least a little uneasy. The snowmobiles kept getting closer, and the whine was getting louder and louder. My wife and I spoke about something. But honestly, I really wasn't listening to her. I was going over the situation in my head. 
and I don't quite remember what we were talking about. The engine sounds were getting louder, and it was obvious they were coming down the same trail that we were on. I suppose it could have been anyone, perhaps a father and son enjoying the day, or a couple of friends off to meet up with some of their buddies. Regardless, I just got a very bad feeling. I carry a gun as a direct result of the last weird encounter I had at the cabin. So I made the executive decision to unholster, rack around into the chamber and reholster just in case. Not here to debate the pros and cons of gun carrying, but I do what I do and did what I did and I felt good about it. The trail we were on was about five or six feet wide. So once the snowmobiles came into view, I picked up our dog and then we stood off to the edge of the trail so that they could pass us. I think we played it pretty standard as far as general common courtesy goes. As soon as they saw us, they both stopped in the middle of the trail, about a hundred feet from where we were standing. I waved and they didn't wave back. I could see they were talking back and forth, occasionally looking at us. They seemed to finish up their conversation and gun their engines. Both of them started approaching very fast and appeared to be in a line to hit us. My wife and I stepped back a few steps into the brush and they buzz us full throttle. I'm talking inches, not feet. They continue past us for a bit and then stop, turn back and look at us. I instinctively, almost as a reflex, threw up my free arm, holding a furiously barking Boston Terrier in the other, and yell, what the hell is your problem? One of them replied with a middle finger, revved the engine a few times, and then they both took off down the trail. My wife was a wreck afterwards. I was scared, but she was really scared. The trail we were on basically ends where our property begins. So, if it was the same people from earlier that week, they would know we weren't home. We had another 30 minutes of hiking before we got back, and the whole time we could hear the snowmobiles ahead of us. They didn't disappear and get further away like before. The whole walk back, they were completely within earshot. About after ten minutes, we could hear that they had stopped, and then started driving around at low RPM. The engines were running, but not at the full throttle. After a few minutes, we stopped and waited. They started at full blast again, this time getting further and further away. We waited until we couldn't hear them again, and then headed for the cabin. When we got back, there were snowmobile tracks all around the property, front and back. They had been circling the cabin. We had no way to call the police, so after an extremely short and extremely tense conversation, we promptly packed up, closed the cabin, and left for home. Vacation officially ruined. We contacted the police, but there wasn't much to say other than a couple of assholes on snowmobiles almost ran us over and then drove all over our property. We may have been more selective with our words, and the police were certainly sympathetic. And again, given the break in at my neighbours, they seemed pretty concerned about it. But in the end, there wasn't much for them to do. We gave descriptions, our information, and left. The thing that gets to me the most is that even though my wife acts like it didn't bother her too much, I know it did. I have been going to that cabin my entire life, and some of the best memories I have up there are on that lake. Now, I not only have one, 
but two terrible and frightening experiences at that cabin, where the person I loved the most in the world was potentially at risk. I'd never ask her to go somewhere she didn't feel safe, and honestly, I'm not sure I will feel safe going up there anymore. The good news is that both my neighbours and my family decided to have a proper alarm system installed, so at the very least, someone will be alerted to any future break-in attempts. However, it still doesn't help with the fact that when you are far away from help, you are essentially at the mercy of others. June. My partner Johnny comes upstairs and finds it's cute how I'm checking him out on OkCupid. Okay I'm confused as I haven't logged in lately. Like, in months. How could I have been looking at his account on OkCupid? Okay so I log in and check it out. There's a list of seven or so people that have also been checked out from my account today alone. Johnny is included, and also someone I work with. Well, that's embarrassing. Nope, wasn't me. So it's time to change my password. The next day at work, I was sure to bring it up and laugh about the fact that my OKCupid okay account was hacked to the person who was last in my viewed list. I didn't want this person thinking that I actually looked at his account. We work too closely together, and I already get the impression that he may see me more than just his boss. It always pleased him that his luggage tags printed his middle name and first initials as Christ T. This is not the type of person who should see his own name written out like he's God's gift to earth. I'll refer to him as Chris. Chris just laughed off the OK Cupid hacking comment I made. I found it strange. He had no questions or comments on the subject. Most people would at least ask if you've changed your password, but nothing from Chris. So I brushed off the situation, and a few days later, I was out of office for work. Johnny messages me saying that it happened again, that I checked him out on OK Cupid. No, I didn't, but I changed my password again. Now it's July. It's a weekend. I'm having a lazy morning in bed with Johnny, and I get a Facebook notification. Your account has been logged in from a new location. The IP address points to Chris's hometown. My heart's racing. What the hell is going on? I take care of the Facebook password, and screenshotted the notification. Later that night, I get a text from Chris. Happy fourth boss. I assume he's drunk. I'm worried about being caught having his access to my Facebook revoked so quickly. No, it can't be him doing this. It's just a coincidence, right? Johnny is convinced it's Chris. But that means someone I work with on a very small team is targeting me. This will make work nearly impossible. I can't talk to anyone at work about this. I'll have no way to run my departments. The situation will get minimalized. Chris drank a lot. I'd seen it at work events or when we just traveled just the two of us. He often got out of hand, but everyone just brushed it off. He's young. It was funny. We've all had those nights. But as long as you can show up at work the next day, it's... Fine. I brought it up with him once. Hey Chris, you need to be more cautious about the way you drink at work events. And then he didn't speak to me for three days. I offended him. I told him he's not allowed to have fun at work events. He told me when he finally snapped. And I recoiled. He's three times my size and we're in a secluded space at work. One time whilst travelling with just the two of us, I got very sick. I told him I wouldn't make it for our dinner, so Chris offered to pick something up from a nearby store. 
he knocked on my room door and handed me the water he got me. He tried to make small talk as I thanked him and indicated that I was going to lie down. It was apparent by his stance in my hotel room doorway that he wished to come in. He moved an inch closer and I said goodnight, shut my door and locked every lock I could. It wasn't the only time that he made me feel uncomfortable. I hadn't noticed any other accounts being hacked for a while. I was cautioned around Chris, even disassociated when I could. I avoided work outings if he was going, and I would just back out of lunch plans that he decided to go to once he knew I was going. But we often had to work very closely. We were a team after all, and I couldn't do my job without him, and him without me. Come November, Johnny was online, checking out his FetLife account one evening. He saw I was also online via the old messenger they used to have, and Johnny asked me if I'm logged in. I'm not. Again, my heart's racing. It's different this time though. The violations are beginning to feel commonplace, normal, expected. But this hacking is extreme. No one outside my FetLife friends know about this account. Definitely no one I work with. And there are some faceless nude photos of me there. I reached out to FetLife. They gave me the IP address of the last login. It's the same as the Facebook hack. Shit. I can't avoid this anymore. I can't just pretend it's just coincidences. But I need proof it's Chris. All I have is an IP address and an intuition. I can't take that to HR. The police, maybe? Will they help? Or will it make matters worse if they need to contact my employer? I start looking into the logging history of any account that tracks it. My bank account. Why is there an iPhone logged into it daily? I don't have an iPhone. But Chris does. Shit. This is real. This is happening. So I call the bank when I'm at work. I ask them about the unknown logging. And Chris is at his desk. Right next to mine. The conversation is easily overheard. I hang up with the bank, and they can't help. Chris doesn't say a thing. Under normal conditions, I feel that a co-worker would inquire. Wow, is everything okay? Did you change your password? Did money go missing? Nothing from him, though. So out of character. He's always interested in my personal life. But at this moment, he chooses to remain silent? The next weekend, I wake up to a phone call. The caller is calling from my phone number. My heart skips a beat, but I answer. No one responds. I just hear breathing. I'm losing my sanity. I've spent weeks, months researching IP addresses and how I might be able to use the information I have. I've lost sleep. I can't focus at work. Johnny is worried about me and my safety, and so am I. But what do I do? Johnny suggests we go to the police. I don't want to, but I'm at a dead end. The officer is kinder and more receptive to the situation than I expected. This serves as a reminder to me that this is a big deal. I shouldn't minimalize it in my own thoughts. She takes the report, every detail, and they will use the IP to subpoena the ISP. Weeks go by. The officer on my case claims there's no crimes the ISP records were never obtained. December comes along. My work email keeps doing this strange thing. Messages I've read keep being marked as unread. Weird. Is it him or just multiple devices I used to check it on? I don't know. I can't tell. The server doesn't keep a login history, that I can see at least. Should I talk to IT? I know them well. They will help. But that will make the situation real and known at work. No, not yet. I can't bring myself to do it. I can't do this anymore though. My heart is constantly racing. The slightest noise sends me into a panic. I get a security camera from my front door. I worry a little bit less when I hear the door slam from the wind. Or when the dog barks at someone they hear. 
I'm becoming comfortable living in fear, as much as it is impacting my health. At least I have the pepper spray that John got me, and I carry it whenever I'm outside. Chris and I have shared accounts that we use for work. Maybe I can get an IP address from that. If it matches that, there's some proof, right? What if I send him an IP tracker? I've learned you can place an invisible pixel in an email, and it will send you the IP address of where it was read. All I have of Chris is his work email and Gmail. I test both on myself first, of course. I can't take the risk of him figuring out what I'm doing to him. And damn it, our work emails block it, and Gmail reroutes it to their HQ. Another dead end. More hours, days and weeks pass. I've called private investigators, and they're impressed. I've tried the tactics they already have at their disposal. I feel confident that I'm doing all I can, but more lost that the professionals can't help. Three months later in February, it's my last attempt. It's a week before I have a seven day out of country trip with Chris. It's on a large group this time, but I'll still be working very close with him. Too close. I send Chris an email with a shortened link that will track an IP address from where it was clicked from. I've tested this and it seems to work, but I'm shaking. What if it tips him off? What if he knows I'm onto him? and he attacks me at work. What do I send him to get him to click? I find a local event that this particular breed of neckbeard would be interested. Hey Chris, I saw this and thought you might be interested. Five minutes later Chris replies, pure panic, no, excitement. Maybe a mix of both sets in. I don't care what he replies. I check the IP tracker. I got a hit. I'm shaking. I can barely type or hold my phone. It's the same IP address as the Facebook and FetLife hack I got. I have the proof I need. It's Chris who's been stalking me via my accounts. My intuition was right. As much as I didn't want it to, it confirmed that it was him. There's relief. A weight has been removed. But then it sets back. What do I do now? Go to HR? Back to the police? We've got this trip coming up. My team needs to be there when I do the job. I'll wait till I get back. It's not that bad. I'm used to living like this now. Johnny thinks I'm insane for considering it. He's right. I am. I've lost touch with reality. This situation has me unable to determine what levels of uncomfortable one can and should live with. All night, I debate the decision I've made. I won't wait. I'll do it now. I text my boss Jay the next day, asking him to meet me for lunch on Sunday. I need to speak with you away from the office. This is not a normal request. We're close at work, but this is bizarre to him. He tells me I'm scaring him, and I wish that I can tell him not to worry. The following day, we meet for lunch. I'm so nervous I could vomit. This is it. This makes it all real now, and I tell him everything. I'm worried that he may minimalize the issue. Chris is just a kid, he didn't mean anything. I'll talk to him tomorrow. These are my worries. And after I finish speaking, Jay is at a loss for words. We have a plan in place to take this to HR tomorrow. And he is already helping me find someone to replace Chris on our work trip. Again, I'm relieved and nervous at the same time. Shit is going down tomorrow. Seven months of living in fear. And finally, I can see an end. Then comes Monday. My pepper spray is in my pocket. I picked a work outfit that would conceal it today. Jay calls me, asks me for a question. I don't remember what, but I take it as an invitation to go into his office. Anything to get away from the person I know, without a doubt, has been hacking and stalking me. Jay wasn't expecting me, but understood. The department head is in his office. Jay is about to inform him of my situation Having my story told by a third party was surreal. I filled in the details where needed and gave them a folder of evidence, which I had collected to take to HR. Screenshots, IP addresses, written accounts of the timelines up to this point, the emails from Chris confirming his involvement, and the IP from the IP tracker. The day is a haze. I was at HR's office at least twice, 
saw the police drive through the campus and had to fight my way with the HR director. He didn't feel that I had enough evidence to prove the email I sent to Chris's Gmail was actually the Chris that worked here. I dug through my work email. Bam. He emailed my work email from his Gmail account once. Enough evidence for our non-believers. Hours go by. It's almost 3pm and I don't know what's going on. If I keep leaving my desk, Chris will know something's up. I can't call HR and ask, he'll hear the conversation. Chris walks over to me. Oh shit, he says. He's shoving his work phone in my face too close for comfort. He got an invite to go to HR for 4pm. I'm screaming inside, no one else is around. If he's going to do something to me, now is the time. That notice is the forewarning of being fired. That's how they do it at my job. I manage to look concerned and tell him, I'll let you know if I get one, insinuating maybe our team is being let go, not just you. He walks away, no idea where to. I sit at my desk shaking in fear. I don't know when he will return. How could HR betray me like this? They know the situation. Damn it, they should have warned me if they're about to send it. I could have fled. I could have been somewhere safe. Mike stops at my desk just to say hi and offer me some leftover catering. I can't eat right now. But in this moment, Mike has offered me so much more than just the leftovers. He has no idea of what's going on, but can see in my face that something is wrong. I ask to walk back to his office with him. Chris will never find me there. An hour or forever passes. It's got to be done by now. I know Chris will be escorted back to gather his things, and I don't want to be there for that. I sneak to Jay's office. He checks the area for me, and Chris is gone. Jay heard from HR. As per HR, I'm not allowed to speak to anyone as to why Chris was fired, which is ridiculous. Are they serious? This leaves me so vulnerable. If Chris decides to come back to work, no one would stop him. In fact, they would welcome him with open arms, and I'm left looking like the bitch that fired the nice, quiet kid. Later that week, the IT department took a few extra days to gather Chris's devices. I had time to look through them during the period. The days before our trip were one of so much discovery. Not just what I found on his computer, but what I learned from the people around me. The day after he was fired, I looked into his laptop. It had no issues of getting into his files. I was Chris's boss. I needed his work. His picture folders, a lot of personal stuff, stupid memes, vacation pictures, screenshots of the naked cam girls he chatted with, and me. Some pictures I had never seen before. Some I had. The pictures I was familiar with were from a cruise I went on months earlier with Johnny. Only, these were the ones I deleted. I had a GoPro set to take a picture every 10 minutes that hung from my wrist. While walking around, I inadvertently took close-ups of my ass in a swimsuit. Upon importing my vacation pictures, I deleted those from my computer. Were they still on my card? Then there were some pictures from my Google account. Well, it was pictures of a picture on a screen. He got it to my Google account too? Why didn't I catch that one? Then the ones I'd never seen. Pictures that had been taken around the office and on work trips. Me at my desk. Me bent over, setting up gear. A close-up of a hint of cleavage shot from above. His phone was more of the same. A close-up of my ass when he sat behind me. Me struggling with an AV rack in a closet whilst in a dress. Videos from under a table during my meeting whilst I'm wearing a skirt. Zoomed in up the skirt. Pictures of dates I had written on a post-it. Pictures of my phone showing my FetLife account. The nausea sets in again. I remember all these moments and pictures he'd taken of me. Him nonchalantly on his phone, looking like he was slacking off or answering an email. Little did I know that he was filling his spank bank with images of me during work hours and keeping a record of my days off. Creep. I got into his browser history. It was sickening. He researched how to hack someone's text messages. He stalked friends of mine on Facebook, as well as my partner. He got onto my Amazon, Gmail, Facebook, FetLife, work email, 
OkCupid and bank account. He read old emails of past relationships and stalked images from events I went to. There was hard evidence now. I took it to the local police near work. They couldn't handle it, so I went to the country prosecution office. Most people wouldn't think of that. It was suggested by Johnny's friends. They had a computer forensics department that could handle the case. I met an amazing detective. He took my packet of evidence and listened to the whole story. It's becoming easier to tell, especially when it focuses in on the facts. At my office, I learned more about Chris, how he slandered me to my co-workers. I know I couldn't tell the people I worked with why Chris was fired, but for my safety, I knew I had to tell a few people, just the ones close enough to me. Once they knew the story, I heard things from them like, Chris would complain I didn't pay him enough. He lied and said he made only half of what he actually did to his co-workers. I even fought to get him above normal raises for two years. He lied and said I would withhold work from him, and they usually responded to him by telling him to talk to my boss or HR. Obviously he never did. You can't take lies to HR nor directors. He spread lies around the office, coercing co-workers to take his side. When I wasn't aware that there were sides to be had. From these people, I learned more about the obsession Chris had with me. He craved to have power over me. He showed them my FetLife profile. He bragged about how compatible we are on OkCupid. He even spoke about being obsessed with my partner. He told them that he tried to catfish me. I couldn't blame them though. Chris laid the groundwork and a bit of gaslight on them. To them, I was a bad person and Chris was their friend. Chris was really good at playing the victim and was never able to take any self-responsibility. Nine months went by. I followed up with the detective often. It took a good while to subpoena his evidence from my company then run forensics, and in early September I got a call from the detective. They arrested Chris. They showed up early one morning at his home, where he still lived with his parents, and he admitted to everything. He took the card from the GoPro and recovered the images. He got my password once, when I was walking away from my computer, and he went through my phone when it was left at my desk. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall the shock to his family of the type of person who he actually is. Him, cowering whilst in handcuffs, face to face with what he'd done. No hiding behind a computer screen anymore. I was on vacation when that happened. I remember thinking, it's not long now till everyone at work knows. He's got a court date set. By then it's public record. I can't help if people know after that point. I didn't have to wait that long though. Later that day, co-workers started sending me a link. Hey, didn't you used to work with this guy? What a creep. The link was to a county prosecutor's PR page announcing Chris's arrest, mug shot and all. I came back to work and was able to have the truth come out. It was liberating. It took another nine months for his final court date. I worked with prosecutors during that time to determine how I wanted to proceed. I opted for a probation period instead of going through a trial and fighting for jail time. Whilst Chris deserves the jail time, he wasn't worth my time nor effort, and a trial offered him a slim chance of getting off scot-free. Also, this way he would get some much needed counselling. Three years, no contact with me. Three years sexual offence counselling. Three years of checking in with a probation officer. This way, I can at least hope he will come out understanding with what he did was unacceptable and fingers crossed he will never do it again to a living human being. I know there was no chance of rehab in jail. During the hearing I was nervous. I didn't want to see Chris but I knew whatever I was feeling he was feeling a thousand times worse. I didn't have to go but I knew I would regret it if I didn't. With my fiance Johnny at my side I watched as he got up in front of the judge after he cried in the courtroom and agreed to the terms of his sentence.
When I was younger, my mom moved our family to northern Minnesota. The upstairs had my room, my brother's room, and the guest room, which was where the attic was, and my mom's room was in the basement. The kitchen and main living room were on the upper level. The hallway where our rooms were led to a bathroom in the kitchen. Now I have to say that the guest room always freaked me out. When I would open the door in the morning, I would see it and have to walk past it. It had a really bad vibe coming from it, and it made my stomach churn just looking at that door. The feeling got even worse once you were inside. It was always colder walking by that room. And when you went in, it was even colder than that. Almost every night, I would hear footsteps in the attic. It was a small attic, so no one could really fit inside it. A month or so after we moved in, we took a peek up there and found a flashlight and some other tools. They were in the back corner, so you'd have to crouch and walk to get them. So months go by and every night there were footsteps pacing back and forth. My brother heard them as well, but he didn't seem to mind them as much as I did. Skip forward a few years and I'm 16 and the footsteps still happen. One night, I was lying on my bed, petting the cat. It was around 2.30 a.m. My lights were on and my bedroom door was open, and I began to hear the footsteps, this time coming from the kitchen. The footsteps then began to sound like they were running, back and forth around the kitchen and into the living room, all the way to the front door where it would hit the handle. I'm frozen in bed holding my cat, the footsteps continuing to go to the front door, and when it sounded like the handle was hit, I bolted up, slammed my door shut, and locked it. I think I angered whatever it was, because it ran to the kitchen, down my hallway, and straight to my door. Something began to pull on my door. The handle was being pulled aggressively, and after a while, it sounded like the door was being ripped from its hinges. It ended up making a crack in the door itself near the handle. The thing ran back into the kitchen, then back down the hallway, once again pulling at my door. It began heading back to the kitchen, but something extremely weird happened too. I heard another sound, like a dog. We only had one dog at the time, and he was in my brother's room with him. After about three minutes of the dog's paws clicking on the kitchen floor, Everything went quiet. It was definitely creepy, but mostly bizarre. Skip forward half a year and I was friends with a girl who was a few years older than me. She was 20 at the time and I was 17. We'll call her A. A and I went out and bought a Ouija board. Dumb, I know. During the night I would sneak out of my house and we'd go to very old churches, graveyards and parks trying to contact spirits. At one point, we had the planchette in the glove compartment, and the board was in the trunk. We just got to the church we were going to, grabbed the board, but we forgot the planchette. Yet upon looking in the glove compartment, it was no longer there. We had used it at the cemetery last, but now it was gone. We checked everywhere, only to find it 20 minutes later in the cup holders, which we had checked a dozen times since then. We brushed this off and did our session at the church as usual. After nothing seemed to happen, we got up to leave, but something sliced up A's arm. She welled out in pain and I could see a long straight cut going up her bicep. We ran out of that church. We went back to my house where she brought the board and planchette in, and we locked them away in separate spots. By 2 a.m., we had long gone to bed, I was on the floor and she was on my bed. The door was closed and locked. I was having trouble falling asleep though. By the time 3 a.m. rolled around, I was still awake. The footsteps in the kitchen started up again. I paused my show and began to listen. Then the door starts shaking again. The handle going crazy like last time. It's so loud that it wakes up A. She stares at the door with me and begins to cry. Being in the floor, I had an idea. 
I want to see if I can see the thing doing this. So I lay my head on the floor, flat and sideways, trying to peer under the door crack. But there's no one there. Of course there's no one there. I didn't sleep at all that night. And the next day we looked in the guest room to see flakes of the attic door, as if someone had exited or entered the attic, or perhaps both. A leaves, and I tell my brother about the incident. He tells me it'll be fine, but I still decide to sprinkle some salt around the attic opening, and believe it or not, the happenings have stopped. I believe that whatever's in that attic is some sort of demon, but I can't be sure because it switched between human and dog-like footprints so easily. Whatever it is, it's not human, and it's not of this world. This happened when I was ten years old, before my mother passed away. It was the mid-80s in a small town in Texas, I was allowed to play outside in the summer until mom turned on the porch light, which was usually every night between 8 or 9 p.m. Basically, if I stayed out until I couldn't see anymore, then there would be hell to pay. Now, I'd never known a dog that I couldn't pet, even the ones my older brother was scared of. I could always just walk up to them. They seemed to like me, even the strays and scamps about town. One day, I was out playing in the yard, watching the fireflies, and playing in the little sandbox I had, when I suddenly heard a strange-sounding bark outside my fence. It was a deep bark from what I thought would be a very big dog. I looked away from the glowing fireflies, wanting to see this friendly dog. I was always up to meet a new furry friend. What I saw instead was a shadow of a massive dog outside our chain link gate. It seemed to be fluffy and far blacker than even the night around it. The dog's head was down, so I could not see its eyes at that time. I still hopped out of the sandbox, ready to go meet the dog. I began walking towards the gate as the black dog stood there, then opened it. When out of nowhere, my dog Bambi, who was a mid-sized mixed-breed dog, came out of nowhere, snarling up a storm and getting between me and this other dog. Bambi has only acted like this one other time, dealing with a very angry man, but that's another story. As soon as Bambi showed up, the dog raised its huge head, growling a low guttural growl that I could feel as much as here. I could now see two glowing red eyes like flames looking at me. It was then that I was finally scared of this thing that was obviously not a normal dog. I was so scared that I couldn't move. My dog snarled still, letting out a big, loud bark. My mother heard this and knew it was unlike Bambi to act that way. She ran out the front door and was behind me before I knew it. She also saw the black thing in front of me, and saw Bambi between us trying to protect me. I'd never seen an expression on someone's face so terrified and angry at the same time. She grabbed me and began to yell out a random prayer. Then she grabbed Bambi by the collar and began to pull us back to the house. But that shadowy dog bit her leg, leaving a big gash which would then permanently scar. There was a trail of my mother's blood leading all the way back to the house, but that shadowy dog, it wouldn't go past the gate, as if there was a border there that we could not see. After getting us inside, my mother quickly tended to the bleeding, cleaning the wound and praying faster than ever. Then she did something that confused me at the time, because I'd never seen it before. She began to sprinkle little lines of salt around every entryway and window. That night, I didn't sleep very well, and instead sat up with my dog in bed, waiting for daylight to break. 
From that day on, Bambi would never leave my side, except on days I had to go to school. I think Bambi saved my life. I think if she hadn't been there, that, that shadow dog would have gotten to me. After this experience, Mom got me an old small silver cross that I wear to this day. I definitely believe that that dog was a hellhound, but why it wanted to attack me, I may never know.